Got 20 pages, half a can of PBR, and I'm not wearing pants. Hit it! Hi there. I'm Haruka. I love soccer. It's kind of my thing. But it's less that I love soccer itself and more that I just really love the Chicago Fire. But not a lot of people know about MLS, the beautiful twisted fantasy world of soccer. So uh, after my preview from last week and last year when I did an entire video on what uh, anime is related to your favorite MLS team, I'm just gonna tell you the entire history of MLS. So uh, before we dive in, I wanna make sure I say a couple of things. First, I don't care about what you say about quality of play. Sure, whatever, European soccer may be better technically, but how can you feel anything watching Barcelona run around Ibar for 90 minutes when you can watch World Cup winners yell at some college kid to cover their mark? Second, the world of MLS is based not on talent, but narrative and chaos. This is why it's important to understand the history of the league before starting to watch, because these narratives are long and strong. This is going to take a while, but please stick around because this is probably the most fun I'm going to have making a video in a while. So here we got some uh, precursors from uh, the 1800s all the way to 1994. Uh, I'm not going to get into the origins of the sport, but I will give a quick bit about the beginnings of soccer in America because it's integral into the way MLS is run. According to research, soccer in America actually originates in New Orleans in the 1860s, not New York. There's actually the first official team, which was in Boston, but they also didn't actually actually play soccer. Much like baseball, different places had their own rules. The first leagues were named with the word football. Uh, soccer was introduced back in the 1910s as a shortened form of the term association football, and Americans decided that since that shortened word already existed and one for American football didn't exist, they just used soccer. In fact, the U.S. Soccer Federation had the word football in its name until the 1970s. Speaking of the U.S. Soccer Federation, in the 1920s, there was a massive civil war between two competing factions, the American Soccer League and the United States Football Association, the U.S. Soccer Federation. The USFA was recognized as the official governing body of soccer in America by FIFA. When the ASL was created to be the official top division of the country, the league was almost instantly in trouble for getting a ton of big foreign players. FIFA essentially had to threaten to expel the USFA to solve things. But then, the ASL owners started to go after the USFA, who insisted that the ASL teams play in the National Challenge Cup, now the US Open Cup. The ASL was mostly Northeastern, and the US Open Cup meant that not only did the USFA take a percentage of the ticket sales, but the travel would be absolutely brutal for these clubs. ASL owners, led by MLB owner Horace Stoneham, felt that the USFA wasn't being American enough and wanted their league to be different and more like baseball. They wanted everything to be contained by the owners, they wanted to create a separate league for the Midwest and have a championship final at the end between the winners of the two leagues, reminiscent of the Super Bowl around 50 years later or, you know, just the World Series. <laughs> also with that second division, they didn't want promotion relegation like how everyone else in Europe was doing it. There's no pro rel in baseball, so why should we do something so un-American? After pressure from FIFA basically calling the ASL an outlaw league, things were settled in October of 1929 and the ASL planned to work with the USFA again just a couple weeks before the stock market crashed. So interest in soccer died down because it became a foreign thing and because the league was already staggered before the most staggering thing in the world at that time, the Great Depression. So things came back in the 1960s after the NCAA somehow helped the popularity of soccer and the NASL was started in 1968. This wasn't really much until Pele signed for the New York Cosmos in 1975. From there, a massive amount of legendary players flocked to America, mostly near the end of their careers. The Cosmos got Pele, Carlos Alberto, and Franz Beckenbauer. That's a surprise. Fort Lauderdale strikers got Gordon Banks and Gerd Mueller. Los Angeles Aztecs were getting George Best and Johan Cruyff. Even the Seattle Sounders had Sir Bobby Moore in 1978. The problem they ran into was unchecked expansion. Teams were popping up left and right trying to spend that kind of money on big players and the disparity was apparent. The difference between the highest drawing teams and the lowest drawing teams was in the 30,000s. They went from nine teams in 1973 to 15 in 1974. Then, by 1978, it was 24 teams. But a lot of these smaller teams just couldn't sustain themselves, especially with the economic recession of the early 80s. Without a salary cap, these teams were spending 70% of their operating budget on players, 
which is not how you run a sports team. It should be closer to around 40 to 45 percent. Teams were losing so much money that from 1980 to 1983, half the teams had folded. Teams were losing millions of dollars, which is massive in the 80s. And in 1984, the Outdoor League's final season, they were back down to nine teams. The final champions of the NASL Soccer Bowl were the Chicago Sting in 1984, a team that narrowly avoided the overexpensive player route and ended up with a higher attendance with their indoor team than the Chicago Bulls. This was just a couple of years before Jordan was drafted. It was also a team that was led by Karl Heinz Granitza, a man who didn't really do anything with his career outside of his time with Chicago. So things had fallen apart, but a promise was made in 1988. When the United States won the bid to host the World Cup in 1994, they made a promise to FIFA to make a professional league soon after that World Cup. And they did, starting in 1996. They chose to learn from the mistakes of their precursors. All teams were owned by the league and leased out to the quote unquote owners. If a team is run poorly or an owner walks out, the league itself can take over and make sure it doesn't crash and burn. All contracts with players are with the league and players are allocated to their teams. If you've got a problem with that, too bad. Fraser versus MLS in 1996 basically said that the team was exempt from antitrust since it was owned by the USSF and can't collude with itself. And there's competition with leagues other than MLS for players, therefore it's not a monopoly. Also there's no promotion relegation. It makes sure there continues to be a financial incentive for owners since they won't see their team's value go down. It also just generally makes things easier for American audiences. Uh, generally, they Americanized the game as well. A salary cap was on the league from the very beginning, controlling the amount teams can spend on salaries. Also, a limit was placed on the amount of foreign players allowed in the squad. There was five at the time. The winner of the league wasn't the team at the top of the table at the end, it was the winner of the playoffs. Hockey style shootouts instead of draws, the time counted down instead of up like basketball, football, and other American sports. Drafts were implemented as a core part of the league. The first player taken in the inaugural draft was Brian McBride, and then there was the college draft. The least successful round of this draft was actually the first round. Then there's a supplemental draft in which uh, only two players taken in the first ever round ever amounted to anything. And that was uh, Chris Armas and Paul Caligari. Also, the team names and logos are just extremely American. I mean, San Jose Clash. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to tell you about it. It all starts in 1996, finally. There were 10 teams. The Columbus Crew was the first official team, and they make sure you, they tell you about it every single time. Then there's the Colorado Rapids, DC United, Dallas Burn, the Kansas City Wiz, uh, Los Angeles Galaxy, New England Revolution, New York, New Jersey, Metro Stars, San Jose Clash, and Tampa Bay Mutiny. The first major players were mostly national team players happy to finally play at home like Alexi Lalas or Eric Winalda, but there were still some major foreign players. Colombian midfielder Carlos Valderrama went to Tampa Bay, Mexican striker Hugo Sanchez was in Dallas, Mexican goalkeeper Jorge Campos was in LA, Bolivian midfielder Marco Echeverri was in DC, and despite Valderrama and the Mutiny topping the table in the regular season, it was Echeverri and DC United who won the first MLS Cup. It was an incredibly cold and wet game at Foxborough when Eddie Pope hit the golden goal in overtime and proceeded to dive into the puddle at the corner flag. The team was coached by Bruce Arena. He was drafted by the New York Cosmos in 1974, just before Pele, and he was cut just before the season. His prior experience in coaching came with the University of Virginia for about 17 years, although seven of those years were also spent coaching lacrosse. Then we have the Metro Stars update. This is a update that I'm just going to give you uh, based on the Metro Stars of the time uh, throughout the history of MLS. The first ever home game in Metro Stars history ended with Nicola Caricola, the first ever pick in the supplemental draft, scoring an own goal in front of 46,000 people. <laughs> We enter 1997. Things dropped off. The team with the smallest stadium was the San Jose Clash with a 30,500 capacity. The team with the highest attendance was the Revs with about 20,500. So there was not a lot of stadiums being filled and it was much, much less than filled. It was like fraction of capacity. The league was no longer new and shiny. So they announced some expansion, the Chicago Fire and Miami Fusion. Both would start playing next season, but this season ended with DC United dominating again. They won the regular season and MLS Cup. Time for the first expansion pack. The Fire are here. First, MLS actually signed Peter Novak to the Chicago MLS team before even getting a coach or a name. Then they got DC assistant Bob Bradley, who then built a really good team made up of mostly players from within the league. They beat DC United in the MLS Cup, and then they won the US Open Cup at home. Despite being the away team, uh, weather happened. Uh, this is, you know what, that's a story for another time. Uh, Metro Stars update. Please do not refer to this team as the New York, New Jersey Metro Stars. They have decided to just go by Metro Stars in 1998. Please respect their wishes. In 1998, 
I was born. Also, they got rid of the shootout and the countdown clock because it was just stupid. The countdown clock was stupid, but the shootout was not and will never be stupid. The supporter shield is created to be awarded to the team who won the regular season and was funded by the supporters. Uh, my dad actually gave him 20 bucks. First officially awarded to DC United, who is now without Bruce Arena, but don't worry, he'll be back later. DC also won the MLS Cup. But more importantly, we've got a Metro Stars update. The Metro Stars have had the worst season of all time, only 15 points out of 32 games. Man. <laughs> Metro Stars. Teams started ditching the big cavernous stadiums they were playing in and moved on to smaller stadiums they owned. First was, once again, Columbus Crew. They switched from two conferences into three divisions. Due to this weird thing over the next three years, the Chicago Fire would be the first and only team to be the champions of the Western, Central, and later the Eastern Conferences. The Wizards blasted in out of nowhere to become a legitimate force. They went from the second worst team in the league to winning the Supporters' Shield and later outlasting the Fire in the MLS Cup to win that as well. They won off of the slowest rolling goal ever. There wasn't really even any substantial change with the team other than a coaching change. This sort of happens a lot. Teams change fortunes wildly and sporadically without too much actually changing. And uh, Tony Miola, a goalkeeper, won MVP. This was also the first year that they called the College Draft the Super Draft. I don't know why. It's still called that for some reason. Uh, Metro Stars update. This season, they got legendary German midfielder Lothar Matthäus. He became one of the most legendary flops in the history of MLS. He made 16 appearances and seemed confused as to why anyone was playing soccer around him while he was on the pitch. Trust me, he was a big name in Germany. <laughs> 2001, Landon Donovan came to San Jose on loan from Bayern Leverkusen. Donovan would never actually belong to the Quakes for the entire time he played for them. He was on loan for four years. The fire got Christo Stoichkov, who turned out to be a much better influential Ballon d'Or winner than Mateus. The season was shortened due to 9-11, uh, but they still did continue playing. The MLS Cup was the first instance of what MLS loves to call El Clasico. Uh, LA Galaxy versus San Jose Earthquakes. The stars of this game were Landon Donovan and the fire fans that filled Crew Stadium because they literally owned the place from the moment it opened up to about 2008-ish. Metro Stars update, they made the playoffs, but then they bungled it in a deciding game three and lost on a golden goal. This will be a theme. Now for the Dark Ages. At this point, I should probably talk about how the league itself was starting to fail. As I mentioned earlier, attendance was cratering. Owners were losing a lot of money. Uh, not to mention most of the league was just owned by two people, Lamar Hunt and Phil Anschutz. There's a story about how in 2001, the league effectively folded. It was only saved when Lamar Hunt called the rest of the owners and convinced them to continue funneling money into this hole. Once again, the league was dominated by three teams that could do whatever they wanted to do, and then a bunch of teams that couldn't. And two of them, the Fire and Galaxy, were owned by the same person, Phil Anschutz. The Tampa Bay Mutiny folded and so did the Miami Fusion, despite both teams being fairly decorated for the Young League. Uh, a couple quick things from the dispersal draft of those two teams. Uh, Pablo Mastorini and Cal Beckerman went from Miami to Colorado. Nick Romando ended up on DC United. Prucky went to Kansas City. Steve Ralston went to the Revs. Tyrone Marshall went to the Galaxy. And these players would become synonymous with the team that they went to, except Beckerman but we'll get back to him later. Uh, in 2002, Taylor Twelman goes to the Revs in the draft and lights it up. He ended the season second in scoring with 23 goals. I don't know why he was eligible for the draft. Uh, it says that he came from 1860 Munich and not a college. Maybe that explains why he didn't win Rookie of the Year. Kyle Martino actually won that one. And both of them are now analysts. Anyway, back to 2002. The Revs' second round pick, Charlie Joseph, would also become a top tier MLS player. This was also the year Carlos Ruiz, the greatest flopper in all of the Western Hemisphere joined the LA Galaxy. He scored 24 goals and won MVP. He also scored the golden goal against Twelman's Revs in the MLS Cup. Also, the US national team absolutely went ham in the 2002 World Cup, boosting interest back into MLS where many of those players came from. Thanks, Bruce Arena. I knew you'd come back. 2003. Up until this point, the playoffs were all best of three games, which is stupid. Instead, they switched now to the home and away league games that the rest of the world uses. Uh, MLS had been running an all-star game similar to that of other American leagues with an East versus West or US versus World type games, but this year they decided to take an entire all-star team to go up against a normal club team. The all-star team beat Chivas Guadalajara 3-1, forever solidifying my lunch table argument that the Fire could absolutely beat Chivas. The Fire actually won the Supporters' Shield this season and made the final led by Ante Razov, Damani Ralph, Carlos Bocanegra, and Demarcus Beasley. They lost 4-2 to the Donovan-led Quakes in LA and all of Section 8 flipped 
flipped him off. Metro Stars update, the Fire actually weren't coached by Bob Bradley this season because they traded Bob to the Metro Stars for former Rookie of the Year Rodrigo Faria. Faria would make five appearances for the Fire and ended his career later that year while playing for the Earthquakes. He was on the bench against the Fire in the MLS Cup. Also, the Metro Stars made bank in the Super Draft, picking up future league legends Ricardo Clark, Mike McGee, and Eddie Gavin. Although all three were pretty good in New Jersey, none of them would be remembered for their time there. Also, Tim Howard was sold to Manchester United, so that's fun. 2004. This was the year 14-year-old Freddie Adu showed up in the league. He was coached by former Fire legend Peter Novak. They won MLS Cup, and years later, allegations would come out against Novak's treatment of players, especially the young Adu. But while I'm talking about DC United, I want to mention a few players. Remember the name Ben Olsen. He's going to be very important for DC. Also, just want to point out MLS legends Jaime Moreno, who had been around since the beginning, and Aleko Eskandarian, who was their number one draft pick last year. Also entering the league this season was Clint Dempsey, but he's not going to be important until later. MLS is very good at foreshadowing. Anyway, I try not to think about this season too much. 2005 is next. The league seemed to finally feel comfortable again, restarting expansion with Real Salt Lake and Chivas USA. Yes, Chivas USA was owned by Liga Mackey's team Chivas Guadalajara. Yes, their story gets weirder. Also, the Dallas Burn rebranded to FC Dallas, setting a very dangerous precedent for the rest of the league. Metro Stars update, they fired Bob Bradley, the only American team ever to do so. So Bob went to Chivas, becoming their third full-time head coach in just one year. I told you Chivas was weird. Also, the Galaxy signed Donovan outright when it was clear that Leverkusen would never play him. LA would win the MLS Cup in extra time in a game that against the Revs that involved 10 yellow cards. The MLS All-Star game was against Fulham this season, and Bowling for Soup played at halftime. Before I move on, I need to mention one of the greatest trades in the history of MLS, even better than Bob Bradley for Rodrigo Faria. Real Salt Lake sent one of their international slots to the Colorado Rapids permanently for Adolfo Gregorio. Gregorio would go on to make six appearances and then get released before the next season. Meanwhile, international slots have become an increasingly precious commodity over the years, never being traded for more than a season or two. There is a better similar trade that we'll get to later. That's why this is one of the greatest trades, not the greatest trade but we'll get to it. Now, it's time for the Beckham era. 2006. The Quakes moved from San Jose to become Houston Dynamo because they couldn't get a soccer-specific stadium, but the Chicago Fire got their own. Metro Stars update, the team was bought by Red Bull and became New York Red Bulls. They picked up Bruce Arena as coach. The Metro Star name will now be passed on to Chivas USA, who spend most of their time picking up former Chicago Fire players like Jesse Marsh, Ante Razov, and Orlando Perez, forever solidifying my lunch table debate that Chivas wishes that it was the Chicago Fire. Anyway, the brand new Houston Dynamo, which was really just the Quakes, won MLS Cup in their first season, beating the Revs. The Revs losing in the MLS Cup will be a very common thing. Also, the All-Star game was in Chicago and I was there. We need to talk about the Beckham rule. So I said earlier that MLS was designed with a salary cap. Well, MLS likes to break its own rules a lot. It's something similar to a dungeon master in D&D having a rule of cool. If whatever you suggest is fun enough, we'll stretch the rules so you can do it. What happened was, David Beckham was actually really interested in playing soccer in LA towards the end of his career. But at the same time, the man needs to be paid like the world-class star he is. So MLS just sort of changed the rules so he could be signed for $6.5 million. The rule was that each team was given one designated player to be exempt from salary cap calculations. They would be calculated at the max contract allows, but could be paid well over that max contract. This led to MLS finally finding ways to bring in bigger and better players. Quickly following Beckham to LA was Cuauhtémoc Blanco going to Chicago, Juan Pablo Angel going to New York, and Guillermo barros going to Columbus. In 2007, Toronto FC showed up in the league selling out BMO Field. They also sucked, but at least Canada had a soccer team. Their first home win was actually against the Fire. Uh, just mentioning that uh, for some future things. Completely unrelated, Metro Stars update. Chivas USA is actually good this season. They were top of the Western Conference and second in the Supporters' Shield. Then they lost to the Wizards in the first round of the playoffs. That's right, despite signing one of the most recognizable soccer players in the world and retaining one of the most recognizable American soccer players of all time, the Galaxy finished third from last this season. They were coached by Frank Gallup. Also, they kept losing to Chivas USA, which is kind of funny considering, you know, later Chivas USA. I don't know when Beckham's first win against Chivas USA was, but I don't think it was for like at least two or three years. Anyway, the same thing happened this year with the Revs losing to Houston the MLS Cup. 2008. So some weird coaching things happened this season. Juan Carlos Osorio was hired by the Fire in the middle of the 2007 season, but his wife didn't want to live in Chicago, so he resigned. Then the Red Bulls decided not to renew Bruce Arena's contract, picking up Osorio as replacement. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, Frank Yelp was traded from LA to the San Jose Earthquakes. Oh yeah, the Quakes 
are back. Uh, anyway, the Quakes send back Rude Gullet. Rude Gullet's gals continue to suck for 2008, so he and Alexi Laos are both fired and replaced by Bruce Arena. And this is how Bruce Arena ended up in LA to begin his own reign of terror. And an update on the Beckham rule of the seven player of the month awards handed out four of the winners are designated players. None of those winners are Beckham. Josh Lambeau was drafted 8th overall by FC Dallas. He would go on to have a wonderful career as the kicker for the Jacksonville Jaguars. This time, the Fire finally beat the Revs in the playoffs, but they lose to Columbus, who would finally win the MLS Cup for the Eastern Conference against fellow Eastern Conference team Red Bulls. So MLS had this weird thing where the playoffs were the top three teams from each conference and then the next two teams with the most points in the overall table. This will be a thing and kind of important later. Metrostar's update, Chivas is the top team in the West again. They also lost in the first round of the playoffs, again. And they lost in their first game in the US Open Cup this season against a semi-pro team in Seattle. This was the time Seattle invented soccer. In 2009, the Seattle Sounders invented soccer. While other teams struggled to get above 60% capacity in their soccer-specific stadiums, Seattle was selling out Quest Field. They went out and got the other legendary coach of early MLS, Siggy Schmidt, who had just won the MLS Cup with Columbus. They hit big on almost every signing. Steve Zakawani was their first draft pick. Freddie Montero and Osvaldo Alonso would play almost their entire careers in Seattle. Nate Jaqua came from the fire in the expansion draft to make an instant impact, and their first designated player was Freddie Yunberg. And he also played two massive international friendlies in the middle of the season against Chelsea and Barcelona. And they made the playoffs behind the supporter shield by only two points. And while they lost in the playoffs, they won the MLS Cup in their first try as an MLS team. Anyway, the MLS was sort of the opposite of the season prior, where instead of both teams being Eastern Conference, both were Western Conference. RSL beat the Galaxy on penalties. RSL had developed over the past couple years to be a team led by Captain Cal Beckerman. Yep, that's where he ended up. Remember him? And Nick Mondo is there too. In fact, RSL won the Eastern Conference Final with the same score on penalties. Also, Metrostar's update, Chivas lost to LA in the first round of the playoffs again. 2010, say hi to the Philadelphia Union. Actually, we don't care about them yet, except they got Peter Novak and later they're gonna get Freddie Adu. But uh, let's move on now. Say hi to the Thierry Henry rule. Instead of just one designated player, teams are allowed to sign two and have the option to pay a luxury tax for a third. Some teams use this rule to perfection, like the Red Bulls who picked up Thierry Henry to compliment Juan Pablo on hell. Let's not talk about Rafa Marquez. Uh, then there's the Fire who ditched Blanco and got Freddie Jumberg and Neri Castillo. Jumberg would make 15 appearances and then leave. Uh, Neri Castillo made eight appearances. His first appearance was as a sub, an occasion where the team lit fireworks for his entrance onto the pitch. Again, eight appearances, he was already past his sell-by date for the Mexican national team. He now allegedly runs a bait and tackle shop in Greece. Anyway, MLS Cup 2010 is regarded as the weirdest MLS Cup of all time. The game was held in Toronto in late November, so it was pretty damn cold. Both teams pulled off stupidly massive upsets to get here. Colorado Rapids beat Columbus in the first round. FC Dallas beat both defending champs RSL and runners-up LA Galaxy. It was essentially David versus David. Neither team had a good local following. The game itself was a come-from-behind victory for the Rapids. Uh, the game-winning goal came an extra time off of an own goal. This is what MLS is, and it is beautiful. 2011. Following their MLS Cup win, I must now tell you about the greatest trade in MLS history. Three days after the win, Colorado Rapids initiated a trade with the Vancouver Whitecaps expansion team. The Whitecaps had picked Sananiasi in the expansion draft, and the Rapids wanted him. So they traded an international slot for him. But they didn't trade a one-year slot, they didn't even trade a permanent slot. They traded their slot for the next 21 years. I don't know if it was some sort of typo that made it through, but this was such a weird trade and I love it. The Rapids will get their slot back in 2032. So I mentioned the Whitecaps, but I should also mention the Portland Timbers who will now be here specifically to antagonize the Sounders. The general consensus is that the Sounders are the annoying tech hipsters and the Timbers are the cool IPA lumberjack hipsters. In addition to new teams, the Kansas City Wizards finally realized how weird their name was and switched back to being Sporting Kansas City. Once again, a dangerous precedent was being upheld. This season, Beckham finally got his MLS Cup and what was essentially the old El Clasico against the Houston Dynamo. Except the Quakes are still back. That's not the Quakes anymore. There's new Quakes now. Anyway, Robbie Keane is here for the gals and he's a big money player. Or you can call him Keane Money. Wink. For my uh, fire fans out there. <laughs>
2012, the Montreal Impact are here as expansion continues at an alarming rate. The team was coached by former Fire legend Jesse Marsh, and the first game came at home against the Chicago Fire. It was Beckham versus Houston in the final again. Both teams were actually in the wild card round. Houston beat the Fire in Chicago, a game my dad wouldn't let me go to because it was a school night, not realizing that by the time the team would make the playoffs again, I'd be in college. And then the Galaxy got past Vancouver at home, and the LA team won on penalties. Not a penalty shootout, I mean that their two winning goals came off of penalties. What I'm saying is that Houston was robbed. Now, a quick Metro Stars update before I enter the next chapter. Uh, Chivas USA has been on the bottom of the Western Conference since 2009. In 2013, a couple of coaches filed a discrimination lawsuit against the club, saying that they were fired for not being of Mexican descent. And weirdly enough, there was some evidence for their case. Chivas Guadalajara's squad rules are well known for being very strictly Mexican. Allegedly, owner Jorge Vergara told staff that if they did not speak Spanish, they would be fired. There were also claims that the team's president asked for two different lists of youth prospects, those who were of Mexican descent and those who weren't. Also, the original Chivas Guadalajara was not doing well. By 2014, they will be in prime position to be relegated, something that they will avoid doing, but not without some questionable business dealings with the league to remain up. By 2014, MLS had to buy Chivas USA back from Vergara. Though they hoped to be back with a rebranded team in 2015, the league just shut it all down at the end of the 2014 season. So with the Metro Stars name now needing a home, I unfortunately know all too well what team became the new Metro Stars. Time for MLS to hit puberty. 2013. The Chicago Fire lost their first game of the season to LA 4-0. They gave up a hat trick to an old Metro Stars guy, Mike McGee. And later that season, they traded for him. And McGee, a local boy from Elmhurst, tore it up for the Fire. He won MVP. And the Fire missed the playoffs, losing the final game of the season 5-2 against the New York Red Bulls. They also lost to DC United at home in the Open Cup, a season where DC would come very close to the Metro Stars points record. 16 points out of 34 games this time. Oh no, am I the Metro Stars? With that win, the Red Bulls won the Supporters' Shield. They still lost in the playoffs, though, uh, because, you know, while you can take the Metro Stars away, the Red Bulls have their own thing going on. It was supporting Kansas City versus RSL in the final, a penalty shootout that went nine rounds. Unfortunately, the winning penalty was a save on my guy, Powerpuff Lovell Palmer. Ah, man. Such a good vibe though. 2014, goodbye Chivas. At least they weren't last in the West for their final season. The Fire are now the Metro Stars. Have I mentioned the homegrown player rule? I haven't. Basically, starting in 2008, MLS teams were allowed to simply sign players straight out of the academy instead of hoping to pick them up in the MLS draft. These signings were encouraged by giving teams the salary cap version of a tax break. Some notable homegrown players to this point, uh, Bill Hamid with DC United, Diego Fagundes with the Revs, DeAndre Yedlin with the Sounders, Will Trapp with the Crew, and now Harry Ship with the Fire. After a few years of feeling a sort of kinship with the Revs, they suddenly got incredibly good this season after picking up Jermaine Jones after a blind draw kept him from going to the Chicago Fire. This was kind of a weird thing that never really happened before or like again, but later it was alleged that it wasn't actually a blind draw, but in fact the owner of the Fire deciding that he didn't want to pay for Jones's salary. The Revs made the MLS Cup final and lost yet again, this time to the LA Galaxy, now just led by Donovan and Keane. 2015. By this season, it feels like the league had sort of solidified itself. Teams were being more mature with the way that they were acquiring players, some teams were actually signing young players from overseas in hopes they'd improve, and some teams were starting to get players that would develop into marquee players for those teams. Clint Dempsey had returned to MLS and become a staple for Seattle. Michael Bradley and Jermaine Defoe were the guys in Toronto until Defoe was replaced by Josie Altidore. Bradley Wright Phillips fit right in for the Red Bulls after Henri retired, but expansion continued. New York City FC and Orlando City are the new kids this year. NYCFC comes in with Andrea Pirlo, Frank Lampard, and David Villa. They were also owned by Manchester City and uh, the New York Yankees, being the highest concentration of evil I have ever seen in sports. Orlando comes in with Kaká and standout Canadian draft pick Kyle Lauren. Despite domination from the Sounders during the regular season since they joined the league, it's actually Portland who wins the first MLS Cup between them. I'd like to take some time to mention the double post game back in the first round of the playoffs where the penalty shootout miss that won it for Portland was one that bounced off of both posts and out. But yeah, the Timbers won it all in Columbus. There was a lady who flipped off the camera as Commissioner Don Garver was talking, and everyone loved it. Now we get into the rebellious teenage years of MLS. 2016. Metro Stars update. The Fire have entered yet another rebuild. This time, they hired the guy who won the U20 World Cup with Serbia, Veljko Paunovic. 
Also, they drafted Jack Harrison first overall and then instantly traded him for the fourth overall pick. They got Brandon Vincent there. Brandon Vincent made a single all-star appearance and then retired early to join a startup company. And I don't want to talk about Jack Harrison. Also, they traded Harry Ship for a 12-pack of Schlitz. Actually, that's probably a better deal than what they actually got. And have I mentioned Drugba? Much like Jermaine Jones, the Fire was supposed to have signed him in 2015, but they simply refused to actually pay for him. And also, their facilities were terrible. They held his discovery rights, which is basically a professional version of dibs. So they got some allocation money, the MLS version of Monopoly money, when they traded those rights to Montreal. MLS is a very silly place. And then Montreal popped off. And the first player of the week in MLS this season was Mike McGee. McGee looked like his career was over after suffering an injury on the fire and then just not getting any better. Then he goes to LA and suddenly he's back on the leaderboard. Fire is pain. Anyway, after a high-scoring Canadian Eastern Conference final, Toronto FC loses the MLS Cup to a Seattle team that does not fire a single shot all game. This strange MLS Cup was also on a cold night in Toronto, except it was between two supposedly good teams. And I repeat, Seattle won this game on penalties after not taking a single shot all game. Ah, MLS foreshadowing. 2017, sometime in March, I got a Twitter DM in the middle of my music theory class that confirmed a rumor that's been swirling around for almost a year now. The Chicago Fire had signed Bastian Schweinsteiger. The moment he showed up, the stadium was immediately full. The team was immediately firing on all cylinders with Nemanja Niklic breaking the club scoring record with 24 goals. Then the all-star break hit and the Fire lost six of their next seven games. After limping into the playoffs, they were then demolished by the Red Bulls in the wildcard game at home for nothing because they didn't attack the defense. Oh God, I God. So. so as for the rest of the league, this was the entrance of Atlanta United and Minnesota United, two very different teams. Atlanta had stacked their team with peak designated players and MLS veterans. Josef Martinez and Miguel Almiron are two of the greatest DP signings in league history. Minnesota had made a very specific commitment to just not have designated players. Their top goal scorer was a guy they had back when they were in the NASL. Not the NASL from earlier in the video, the new NASL that was already defunct again. Their first game against each other was Minnesota's first home game. The pitch was so covered in snow that it was hard to even and see the Minnesota players in their gray kits. Atlanta won 6-1. Josef Martinez scored a hat-trick. Almiron got two as well. Though Minnesota already lost 5-1 in Portland the week before, and Atlanta would drop the fire at home later for nothing. This MLS Cup would basically be just a replay of the previous season, Toronto at home against Seattle. Except this time, Seattle actually took shots, although they were still very late in the game, and Toronto won. The key thing to take away here is that any team that has not taken a shot in the MLS Cup has won the MLS Cup. So just don't take shots. 2018, Metro Stars update, fire suck again. Nothing else to see here. Also, Chivas USA is back, but they're Los Angeles FC now, LAFC. Please respect their wishes. And Bob Bradley is back with them. And they're actually really good. What the fuck? Atlanta wins the MLS Cup, still not in their first year, so haha, <laughs> fire better. Also, the Columbus Crew owner, Anthony Precourt, decides to be an asshole and says he's going to move the original MLS team from Columbus to Austin because he wants a soccer-specific stadium. Also, this news breaks during the playoffs as the crew have a home game. The crew already have a soccer-specific stadium. He just wanted an excuse used to leave. After massive backlash from the entire league, a Columbus-based ownership group had to come in and pay Precourt's Austin expansion fee for him so they could keep the crew in Columbus. Finally, the most recent chapter, existential entropy. MLS is expanding at an alarming rate. While not the massive expansion that the NASL saw, it's still a lot compared from 2004 to 2014. Is this indicative that the league has made it? I don't know, but there are now coalitions in cities around the country falling over themselves to be selected as the next MLS team. In 2019, FC Cincinnati was called up from the USL way before they were ready and went from being the best in the USL to the worst in MLS. 2020 added two more teams in Nashville SC and Beckham's Inter Miami. This past season, we had the addition of Austin FC. This coming year sees Charlotte FC joining and next year we'll have St. Louis FC. And Garbers said that he wants the league to go up to 32 teams. If he wants a league where each team plays each other twice, this isn't sustainable. It's possible that this might be like mitosis where the league gets big enough so that it can split into two pro rel divisions, but that breaks the original promise of the league to owners and investors. Entropy is the natural state of matter and energy being dispersed into the universe. 
MLS is expanding, but with this expansion, there comes a price and a lesson that should have been learned with NESL. 2019, the Galaxy signed Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and that was interesting to watch, and also, much like when they signed David Beckham, they did not play well. The MLS Cup Final was still Sounders versus Toronto, this time it was in Seattle, and Seattle won. 2020, the season started and then it got stopped by COVID, then they made a tournament called Hashtag MLS is Back. It was played in a bubble in Disney World. The Timbers won it against de facto home team Orlando City. The actual MLS Cup final was won by the Columbus crew at home in a partially filled soccer specific stadium. The first one ever built in MLS. That would be the last full season they'd play there. 2021, Seattle lost the playoff game to a team that didn't fire a single shot. RSL planned the long con. Then, RSL made it to the conference finals with absolutely no reason to be there. The MLS Cup was won on penalties by NYCFC in Portland, whatever. One final Metro Stars update. Who are the Metro Stars now? I know I should be ending this soon, but this is a serious question and there should be a real debate around it. There are three main candidates for the title of Metro Stars. The Chicago Fire, retain it. FC Cincinnati, take it. Inter Miami, inherit it. Now, here's my case for the Fire to let it move on. While not a better team, things around the club have fundamentally changed. Not just a rebuild, there's a new owner and a new badge and a new stadium. Well, not new stadium, but... Whatever. A lot of new things are happening for the Fire, so why should they remain the Metro Stars? So, the case for FC Cincinnati taking it, uh, their victory over the Fire in the US Open Cup in 2017 was what gave them their shot at becoming an MLS team, carrying the tradition of the old Metro Stars having something to do with the new Metro Stars. They've also been dead last no matter what they do. They were predicted to have a very good season last year. Like, if you run simulations in Football Manager, they're always really good, and real life, not so much. Then there's the case for Inter Miami. They've also fallen prey to their own Lothar Moteoses and seem incapable of being anything other than mediocre. In the end, MLS is a very strange place and it's always really fun for me to talk this much about something I care this much about. Please tell me who you think is the Metro Stars right now and also your favorite weird MLS story. I got a friend who uh, actually helped me with writing this. Uh, he's a, a colleague of mine. We do a podcast together. Uh, he mentioned the story of Roy Miller. I want you to look up the name Roy Roy Miller, New York Red Bulls, and look up that video. It is amazing. Uh, this has been enough sports. Time to go back to anime next week. A video about a sports anime. This video is actually sponsored by Lucky Cat Sticker Company. Go buy some damn stickers. Slap them on your laptop, slap them on your car, slap them on your own face. I don't care. Go to luckycats.com and enter the code JOCK for 15% off. That's J O C K JOCK for 15% off at luckycats.com. Link in the description. Thank you.